as far as what is ex- what is expected for your body to look like in terms of like shape or size is like bounce back culture is this expectation that um at some point you should be you know, returning or restoring to your pre-pregnancy body. During pregnancy, bodies naturally change a lot in a very fast period. And since we are growing a human inside, it makes sense. But this doesn't make us free of the societal pressures for our bodies to look a certain way, especially after pregnancy. So after pregnancy is one area that the pressure to change our body back is really strong. And as Raquel and I will discuss, there are so many layers to what can make us feel so much pressure around our body and have poor postpartum body image. So you are listening to the Food and Life Freedom Podcast. I'm your host, Emma Townsend, a UK registered dietitian and a certified intuitive eating counselor. I support you to move away from lifelong dieting and feeling stressed with food to develop a positive relationship with food and connection with your body. And just a reminder that we are all unique. So please use this as an opportunity to learn and explore. But if something does not sit with you, then it's not meant for your unique self. And if you have any health concerns, please seek personalized support from a registered healthcare provider. So today's guest is Raquel Griffin. Raquel is a queer therapist, a registered social worker, a certified intuitive eating counsellor based in the Canadian province of Nova Scotia. In her private practice, she specialises in disordered eating, grief and supporting trans and non-binary folks in accessing gender affirming care. So let's jump into today's episode. So I'm joined today by Raquel Griffin. Raquel, huge welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm really looking forward to diving into this conversation on body image in the postpartum period. But before we get started, I'd love to learn a little bit more about you and how you became to be interested in postpartum body image. Yeah, a little bit about me. Um, My pronouns are she, her. Uh, I live in Canada, so a little bit of a wait from where you are. Um, I live on the East Coast in a little Canadian province province, um, known as Nova Scotia, uh, colonially at least, or more commonly known as Nova Scotia. Uh, But I specifically live just outside of Tabuktuk um, or uh, Mi'kmaq, so the land of the Mi'kmaq people. Um, And I've lived in kind of this little cluster of provinces called the Maritimes my whole life. So it's kind of, um, you know, not as populated as some larger cities in the country. Um, And uh, I have a couple dogs. I have a partner and a kid. And when I'm not working, um, I'm usually singing or doing choral, artsy, fartsy stuff on the side or uh, or playing video games uh, outside of spending time with my family, of course. So that's a little bit about me as a person. Um, as far as my interest in postpartum body image, I've always been interested in body image in general and body image concerns and eating disorders, um, mainly because of my own lived experience. I had an eating disorder uh, in my youth for about four years. And then thought I was recovered for like, you know, a decade and and then came to realize I was definitely still living like in a really disordered space um, and started doing this work a lot more uh, professionally. And um, so it's kind of the same for postpartum body image. I'm specifically interested in that because it's kind of what I'm going through now. It's really relevant to my own life. And uh, I'm sure you probably know, you know, just because you do this stuff for a living, it doesn't mean that you're immune from um, having really hard periods or really hard seasons with, uh, with body and with eating just in general. So on top of that, when you do kind of have that disordered, um, that eating disorder experience, it definitely uh, can complicate uh, 
things. So I've been thinking about it a lot over the last few years. There was an added component of kind of complexity for me because I had two pregnancy losses before um, the birth of my child. So I'm currently about 20 months out from birthing my child. So she's, I'm going to have a two-year-old in a few months. Um, so before I birthed her, I had a couple losses and I felt really erased from a lot of spaces because, you know, pregnancy loss is a pretty stigmatized thing and a pretty secretive thing that a lot of people go through alone. Mm -hmm. So I felt erased from a lot of like pregnancy spaces in general. And I felt erased in a lot of like eating disorder recovery spaces as well. Um, because, you know, regardless of whether you get your baby, uh, you still go through body changes and appetite changes, um, and can struggle with eating things when you're pregnant, regardless of whether you're pregnant for like six weeks or 20 weeks or 36 weeks or whatever. Um, so I kind of, in general, became really interested in just reproductive health care in general. And how that kind of intersects with disordered eating and wellness culture. Um, and then it really, you know, amped up when I kind of had, uh, when I got, you know, when I got my baby and when I gave birth. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thank you for sharing your story. It's when you mention recovery from an eating disorder and feeling like you you were recovered but maybe later realizing that there were still those eating disorder thoughts or disordered food and body thoughts it's just so so common that we that for a lot of people with an eating disorder they reach this place of kind of recovery but it's it's not freedom around food or how they feel in their body and I think your story is probably relevant to so many people who've been in this place at then a big life change yeah. so whether that's um, becoming pregnant, postpartum, or an, another big change. Maybe it's like getting married or divorced or um, these big life yeah. events can can bring that more to the surface and then make us realize that actually we are still really struggling. Yeah, like I, you know, I even struggle with like recovery language. I know that's really meaningful for some people. Um, I've, I've kind of abandoned it a little bit myself, um, but we do often it is kind of seen as a destination. And I think uh, I, I was, I think I absolved myself from thinking I had like a problem with the way that I was eating and with my body, because my body still kind of occupied like a really palatable place, like in society, like I have a lot of privilege um, as like a, a white, uh, able-bodied cis woman um, and a body that was always pretty thin. Um, so when that changed, when I had a child, <laughs> I really had kind of a reckoning of my, my values and um, kind of digging through and excavating through that anti-fat bias and fat phobia that I totally didn't think, you know, that I had, but of course we all do because we're all swimming in the soup of diet culture. Yeah, definitely. And I guess if we take a step back then from the postpartum period, just thinking about our world in general, like we're surrounded by these messages about bodies. So we're surrounded by diet culture, swimming mm -hmm. in that diet culture, as you said, and this tells us like how bodies should look or um, that we should be able to control them as well, often through things like food and exercise. So it's really common anyway, whether we've had an eating disorder or we haven't had an eating disorder to, to maybe have some degree of body dissatisfaction or, or body stress, even before maybe going through a pregnancy journey, if we do. Um, mm. so I'd love to, to start just by asking you more generally, like what, what is body image? Yeah, well, I think in its simplest terms, it's the way we think and feel about our body. So, I mean, that can be negative, it can be positive, it can be neutral, it can be all the above, all those things. And and that can shift, you know, throughout the lifespan. Um, and what body image looks like for each person is going to be really different, right? Like that's a really unique, really subjective kind of uh, perception. So I kind of tend to see, um, I find I interchangeably will say like body image or body relationship. 
Um, because I think body image is more of like that perception, like what we think, how we feel, but our relationship to our body, I think is more of, well, what we do about that or what we do in response to that. Right. And that can, Mm -hmm. that can then also include like thoughts and um, like inserting more neutral thoughts or challenging, you know, those unhelpful thoughts about body image. Um, But it, it has that addition of, of behaviors too and actions of, um, you know, I'm not going to pretend that these, you know, these thoughts are going to go away, but if they're going to be here to some degree, you know, what can I do about that? And how can I respond to that so that I can foster like a more, maybe it's accepting, maybe it's loving, maybe it's neutral, um, maybe it's respectful relationship to my body. So like they're, to me, they're so connected because they're so interdependent and like dependent on each other, um, Mm -hmm. either way that I kind of interchangeably use the two, um, a lot of the time, but technically they, they are slightly different, I think. Yeah. I love that connection, but also that distinction because that can support someone who is struggling with. Uh, what feels like poor body image to know that they can actually take steps to work on their relationship with their body um, and yeah. with food and all these things as well, but specifically like with their, their body, even if they currently dislike their body and they, they have poor body image, we can start taking those, those steps to start responding to our body and trusting our body, even if we don't like our body. Yeah. 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 Of course. So the perceptions that we have about our body, what then influences the way we think about it? It's often we can feel maybe just like we're we're born hating our body or we've always hated our body. So there's no, no different way we could be. What is it that, that really influences the way we feel about our body? Um, I think of two main things. One, I think of like family uh, like what our environment was growing up. And I think of um, like dominant discourses. So like, what is like, you know, the main way that a thing is talked about, like culturally and in society of your, you know, your particular area or maybe country where you live. So like, you know, you think about things like media and literature and TV and movies and podcasts and all this different content that we consume and just um, conversationally what most people tend to think and believe about a thing. That's kind of like what I mean by like a dominant discourse or like what's the dominant story of like X or this topic or whatever. And so that can be, you know, that can go across kind of any topic. Um, Like the dominant discourse of like an eating disorder is we instantly probably think of like a very emaciated um, skeletal figure like that's in a hospital, maybe on feeding tubes. And that is a really valid experience for some people. Um, But when that's the only story that is told, and when that's the face of an eating disorder, um, you know, that's really problematic, because statistically, we know that that's the the minority, that's the minority of people that are living with disordered eating, or eating disorders. Um, So why did I start to talk about that? Mm, all the, right the what general influences discourse. us yeah. yeah yeah so I think just the general or the dominant discourse of of bodies you mm. know is gonna really be pervasive in people's lives especially if you occupy or inhabit a body that is deemed you know bad right that is deemed like diseased or um or unhealthy uh, or lazy. Um, and this isn't just about like body shape or size. It's also about, you know, queer bodies and trans bodies and black bodies and racialized bodies, disabled bodies. So, um, bodies are really political. They really are. So like eating disorders to me are a huge social justice issue. Um, so it's always been a little bit odd to me that it's taking up 
such a big space, like in the medical field, and that it's a very medicalized mental health issue, um, mm -hmm. where there's so much like rich social context for, for why this happens for people. I mean, even just looking at food insecurity and what that does to the body and the starvation response and how, you know, so many people go their whole lives without even realizing that they have an eating disorder because, because of these dominant discourses and that dominant discourse is diet culture, right? Like it is that system of beliefs about bodies and about food that becomes really normalized, even though it's kind of messed up. Yeah, definitely. And when we're, we're surrounded by these messages that I may be saying that our body is not, I guess these messages are often hidden in health, but they're not really about health. They encourage really unhealthy behaviors. When we yeah, get to the yeah, bottom yeah. of them, it's really your body for whatever reason is not as worthy. It's not as valuable. It's not as accepted. And when we're surrounded by this, of course, it can then be uh, easy to internalize these messages. So we start to then believe that mm -hmm. about ourselves as well. So it's not just something that's said, you know, outside of us and we still have the confidence and trust in our body. Of course, we're going to start internalizing that and then have these say beliefs that, that we are, um, not in a good body that we aren't as worthy, that we're not as, as valued and that we don't deserve maybe the, even the healthcare support that we do deserve as well can add that extra barrier. Yeah, of course. And, and that pervasiveness, like it trickles down in a hugely impactful way through our upbringing and through our families yeah. or our caregivers yeah. and what things are like in the home. Um, that's like a great example, I think, of how of the pervasiveness of it. Yeah. So when we think this is the type of messaging that we can just receive in general in our world, for someone who's maybe navigating um, a changing body through and after a pregnancy and also having to care for a new baby and the, the changes that brings as well, what are the, the types of messaging that may be received in that space? Yeah, <laughs> a lot. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think it's important to acknowledge uh, that pregnancy and this kind of reproductive health, it's very much within the gender binary. And so with that come a lot of problems. So, so the, me the messages have this underpinning of these like really massive systems of power. So like these messages can be also like transphobic or queer phobic. Um, and so I, I think it's important to acknowledge that, you know, pregnancy can affect all genders, all people who, you know, are assigned female at birth. So there's these additional layers of trauma that people can experience when they have a child, when they give birth. Um, and on top of that, you know, as far as what is ex what is expected for your body to look like in terms of like shape or size is like bounce back culture, is this expectation that um, at some point you should be, you know, returning or restoring to your pre-pregnancy body. Um, and there does tend to be like a grace period for that, I think, but there does come a point in time where uh, I think, I know for me, like I started to get kind of stressed, you know, the more, the further away that I got from the, my child's birth date, the further I, away I got from the date that I birthed her, I started to get more stressed about like, why is my body still like this? You know, like, why isn't my body um, uh, looking like all of my acquaintances? And of course, generalizing here, but many of my acquaintances and friends that gave birth around the same time that I did that trap of body comparison and wondering like, what's wrong with me that like my body looks like this, you know, that we, we buy into this, we buy into this idea that, it's very normal to try and attain a body 
that looks like it hasn't gone through like a major medical event, <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, not just like shape and size and weight, but, you know, skin and stretch marks and scarring um, that these are all, you know, it's, it's bodily evidence left behind from, you know, what for many people can be a really joyful and beautiful time. Um, and then it can kind of shift into this shame and into this embarrassment and to this, how can I hide this? Um, which is really, you know, confusing when often I think during pregnancy, um, you and others give you a lot of permission, right? People expect that you're going to have a big belly when you're pregnant, right? It's celebrated. It's seen as beautiful and you're glowing and how incredible it is. And um, I've heard from, you know, from a lot of other folks, you know, professionally with clients and also with friends personally, that there is a lot of freedom that can show up during pregnancy. And I think it's because people are, it's easier to have that unconditional permission to eat because there's a, there's an acceptance of, well, my, my body's going to get bigger and my belly is going to be huge. And, you know, that's, that's just part of it. And um, yeah. And then after, after, you know, labor and delivery, uh, there's that kind of brief grace period. And then it's like, okay, I have to like get quote unquote back in shape or whatever. And we know what that means. It means restrictive eating and unhealthy relationship to exercise to, to, like I said, try and attain this body that like, doesn't look like it's gone through this like massive life-changing thing, a major medical event. <laughs> Yeah, that was a really long response to your question. And I don't know if I totally got it. But yeah, I think that's the main thing is like, the bounce back culture is so intense. And it's so yeah. normalized. And it's awful. It's such an awful feeling of like this feeling of like, oh, no, like I haven't. Uh, I I still, you know, I people who feel like I look like I had a baby and I shouldn't right that kind of feeling yeah absolutely and no that was a fantastic answer um it does feel like in our world we're kind of sold this message that our body should never change in in general like longer term our body yeah. should just stay the same and that's often from maybe our late teens or early twenties. That's where our body should be. And our body naturally changes at different parts of our life. And I guess pregnancy yes. is a time that it temporarily changes. So it's okay. It's temporary. It's for a medical reason. And then we're expected right. it to come back right where it was because bodies aren't supposed to change, but actually bodies do change. Um, going through a pregnancy is going to change our body. We know that changes our body. So why would our yeah. body end up looking and being the exact same weight and shape and all of that as it was before it's undergone this change? Mm -hmm. We see that with different life events as well, especially um, I guess as people get older as well, it's natural that our bodies do just change. And we often see like, no, we need to, I guess in, in those situations as well, we, we should be staying the same as where we are. But I think the, yeah. the post-pregnancy, especially when we were either maybe grieving the loss of a baby or we are caring for a new baby, both of those mean there's so much else going on for us. Um, a lot of things that can be really exhausting, really tiring. Um, we don't have maybe as much headspace just for, for navigating these difficult emotions and feelings. And I wonder if that mm -hmm. is another trigger for, for putting it back on the body when we're surrounded by all these messages telling us that our body should should look different to what it does. Yeah. And of course, like, who does this affect? It affects like uh, marginalized genders, right? And so that, I think that's where we often see, um, you know, secrecy or stigma around these issues because they affect, you know, bodies that have these particular body parts. Um, like I'll, I'll give you an example of this like bounce back <laughs> culture that that I experienced because 
um, you know, as far as people in my, in my life, you know, I surround myself with a lot of people that, you know, align with my values and for the most yeah. part, um, you know, aren't telling me that there's something wrong with my body and I need to change it or whatever. But I remember um, four months after I gave birth, I was scrolling on Instagram and I came across a post on my feed um, from my local pregnancy unit um, at the hospital here. And it was for like a Q&A on C-sections. Um, and I ended up having a, a C-section um, after 30 labors of hour. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so that ended up happening for me. And so, yeah, like great that they were doing a Q and a on that, but the graphic for this post <laughs> was, uh, a naked, very thin, flat tummied stretch mark free white person from like about, um, just below the chest to the thighs, um, and so even that, you know, like this disembodied image, we see that a lot with, you know, what we, what we consider to be women's bodies, just in media in general, right? And like how yeah. problematic that can be just in terms of uh, gender-based violence and stuff like that. Um, mm. So anyways, it's like this disembodied, like extremely unrealistic picture of someone who has just given birth and like you can see like you know there's a c-section scar um like you know just barely showing and uh there's you know a little newborn baby like laying on the the person's lap um and the baby was positioned in a way too where like it was so low on the body that like you know you could you could almost see this person's pelvic region um but like no visible pubic hair, no stretch marks, like mm -hmm. no, like the like this body did not give birth. Like it did not look like, you know, and it wasn't, it wasn't even a thing where you can justify like, oh, it's been like 10 years or something, and this person quote unquote got their body back. Like there's a newborn baby on on like laying on them. Um, mm -hmm. so the assumption is like, yes, this is probably a model and it's maybe a stock image or whatever, but the message being sent is like, oh, like this is a body that just gave birth via C-section and what they chose to, what they chose for a body or the graphic that they chose for that was really problematic. Like not only really unrealistic, but like a weirdly mm -hmm. sexualized image too of the way yeah. that things were positioned and like the fact that, you know, it was disembodied and, you know, didn't look like the person had any clothes on. Like it was really, it was really weird. And the thing that really um, particularly upset me about that was this wasn't just like a friend or a family member or a neighbor down the street posting something. This was coming from a medical facility, yeah. from a hospital that specializes in reproductive health care. Like it's the only quote unquote women and children's hospital, I think in all of Atlanta, Canada. So that's four different provinces. So it's a really, it's a huge hospital that, you know, specializes in these kinds of things of pregnancy and birth. Um, so I was, I was appalled that like, this is, this is the message that is being sent of, um, that this is normal, what a, what a postpartum body looks like. And, uh, like, of course you're going to feel like shit about your body when you see something like that, from something you deem to be like a legitimate source, like a medical facility. So that's just like an example of like how that bounce back culture comes up and it makes you feel like something is wrong with my body because it does not look like that. And they're saying that yeah. that's like not only like attainable, but it's like normal because that's what they chose for a graphic or a model to use. Yeah, definitely. And I think often when we think about all oh, the messaging that we're receiving, we think about maybe social media, maybe it's friends and family. We think about kind of the outside world, um, TV shows, movies, mm -hmm. this kind of thing. But it's really important to note that it's also within our healthcare space as well. And just Absolutely. those little things like an image that's chosen, if we can't 
relate to that image or it's we obviously can't relate to every single image all bodies are different but if it's just nothing like what's going on for us and especially when it's a place that isn't really widely discussed so um pregnancy bodies and um postpartum body image it's not something that's often maybe discussed enough even within the people experiencing that and then the images we're shown from the medical setting where we're receiving treatment makes our body feel like it's not sort of worthy or it doesn't fit that space that's a huge impact yeah. um, especially if we're already struggling or that's already on our mind a lot yeah I totally agree and I think because of that like there's this weird I think per- perpetuating cycle of people feeling shame about their postpartum bodies and not showing yeah. it and because yeah. it not being really well represented like in mainstream media um, then, you know, people thinking it's not normal. And then, and we don't really see, like, we don't really see what a real post postpartum body can look like. We don't see diverse postpartum bodies yeah. and like, you know, the wide breadth of what that can look like for people. Yeah, definitely. Also thinking in the medical setting, just the language that's used to describe people who are pregnant um, or in general as well it happens but certainly during pregnancy as well like we just thinking of terms um, like geriatric pregnancy which is used a lot for people now because a lot of people are are getting pregnant um, in kind of the later years maybe the late later 30s and we'll hear these terms like geriatric pregnancy and um, that doesn't it creates that sense of maybe shame, um, being different, it being sort of your fault if you have any complications during pregnancy because it's t- t- yeah. termed a, a geriatric pregnancy. So I'm sure there's there's other terms that come up as well that that can create that sense of shame, whether we uh, verbalize that shame or not. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. When you're working with people in uh, the postpartum body image space, do you find that most people you're working with are people who've previously struggled with body image or is it something that can show up uh, just for the first time maybe in in that postpartum period? Um, I think for me, just because of the fact that the main thing I work with is disordered eating, um, I don't think I've ever had a client that didn't struggle in some way with their body or eating um, before having a baby, if that's Mm -hmm. what they're coming to me um, for now after having a baby. I think definitely, you know, the postpartum um, adjustment uh, can like definitely trigger um, like the initiation of an eating disorder or exacerbate an already existing eating disorder. Um, But I find often, you know, uh, it's pretty rare, I think, for it to show up for the first time ever, like feeling dissatisfied with your body after having a baby. When we think about how common it is to have some level of dissatisfaction with our body, that's a lot of people at risk who who might be going to get pregnant or who are pregnant who are then at risk yeah. of of um, experiencing this distress postpartum as well yeah yeah um, and, and and then of course we have to like consider like a lot of the trauma that can happen for people even before they they um get that baby that they've been wanting you know and um pregnancy loss is statistically extremely common, you know, at at least in Canada, you know, up to 25% of pregnancies um, are lost by miscarriage and then about one to 2% for ectopic pregnancy. Um, And, you know, that, that doesn't include things like stillbirth. Um, And I think, I think the last time I checked, I think it was about 15% of couples in Canada struggle with infertility um and then you know you look at you know queer families and queer folks and that sometimes they have less options when it comes to creating um families biologically at least 
And so it can be like a whole road for people to finally get to, um, you know, having their baby and, uh, you know, a lot of grief along the way. And then this added layer of grief sometimes on top of it with adjusting to a new body or, um, you know, loss of the body that you had before and maybe privileges that you had along with it, or maybe even, you know, yeah. worsened stigma or discrimination because if you're in a larger body or in a fat body and like the discrimination that fat folks face in the fertil in the fertility world, like, yeah. you know, it's really astounding. Um, so there's all that stuff that people are bringing into the postpartum period that can really influence, you know, um, how they're able to cope with that and, and what that journey kind of looks like for them. Yeah. Yeah. Often our, our medical setting and just societally as well, we're just focused on maybe the medical side of it. Baby's healthy, the um, parents yeah. are healthy. Yeah, yeah. We don't focus so much on everything else that's going on and what's being brought into it and just how, how people are actually coping with the changes as well. Yeah, there's a lot of appointments, like, and I don't, I don't know what it's like for you in the UK, but in Canada, we have like a free universal healthcare system. It's not perfect, but I'm very grateful that we have it. And yeah, like you have a lot of appointments when you're pregnant. And if there's any kind of concern about anything, they're, they're gonna, you know, there's gonna be extra appointments and tests and ultrasounds or whatever, you know, just, you know, luckily for peace of mind. Um, yeah. And then you have your baby and, you know, you kind of don't see them again. <laughs> you have your like six week <laughs> appointment and that's kind of it. Luckily for me, I have a really amazing family doctor. So that's been great. But yeah, it's kind of jarring when you're like, oh, okay, I'm, I'm on my own now. And, you know, yeah. less questions are asked, you know, about you and it, cause you continue to have lots of appointments for your baby. You know, there's certain checkpoints that they mm. do and immunizations at certain times. So you, you go to the doctor a lot, especially in like those first six months, but, but it's, it's for the baby. It's not really for you. <laughs> yeah. I've forgotten about then. It's so back to normal. Everything's back to normal now. Yeah. Yeah. We know as well that uh, body image in general can affect our relationship with food. It can lead to this maybe sense of wanting to change the body or control the body in some way. And this can also, this can um, often be something that we maybe start to restrict food or have some control, try to have some control over food to change the body. The postpartum period as well has so many other challenges coming on as well. How does the, yeah. how does poor body image during postpartum period, how does that maybe impact on our relationship with food or how can it for some people? Yeah, I, th I think you hit the nail on the head of like, you know, it can, it can lead to disorder eating behaviors that often begin with restriction. You know, when we, when we usually look at disordered eating behaviors, whether it's binging or purging, um, and specifically what that can look like, a lot of the time there's some kind of restriction happening, right? And the power of restriction on the, on the body, biologically speaking, it makes a lot of sense that these other behaviors show up in response to that and in response to the yeah. body kind of being in a survival state. So when you have those feelings and that pressure that your body isn't okay and that it should be smaller or it should be different, um, you know, that dieting mentality or that restrictive mindset can show up and that can sometimes yeah. lead to restrictive eating or this need to, yeah, to eat less or to, um, be, be careful and not, um, yeah, it, yeah, hopefully that, hopefully that made sense. <laughs> Yeah, no, it definitely, we can often, I guess, blame the body as well for the way we're feeling. And then that might lead to, yeah. to feeling like our body doesn't deserve the, the food that it's maybe <clears throat> communicating that it needs. So like it's hunger isn't valid. It doesn't maybe, we're not happy with the way that our body is quote unquote bouncing back compared to other people's bodies. So we might have less like well, yeah, feel our body deserves less or less trust in our body based on that as well. 
Yeah, for sure. And there's, you know, there's a whole piece to here that is really relevant around bodily autonomy mm. and the postpartum period or the pregnancy period for some folks, you know, can be one of where you really lose a lot of control over your body and your body isn't really your own. It's like, yeah, yeah you're important, but really like we're really concerned about baby and yeah. it's a really rife fertile ground for wellness culture to show up and wellness culture is, you know, diet culture is, you know, twin sibling, basically they're the same thing. Um, yeah. And so there can be like a, a, you know, a loss of control and, people not being able to have full autonomy over their bodies, understandably so, you know, in some respects. Um, but that can continue into the postpartum period where, you know, you're adjusting to caring for this new life and this new human. And, uh, and if you like are chest feeding or breastfeeding, your body's still not your own for sometimes like years, <laughs> right? We're like, yeah. uh, like I remember when I uh, stopped breastfeeding around like 13 months after my child was born. Oh my God, like such freedom. And I had, I was very lucky. I had a very easy breastfeeding journey and I was really grateful to be able to feed my baby in the way that I wanted to um but I was so happy when it was over just because I felt like I was able to reclaim part of my like physical self again right like it was no longer um you know this thing or this object or this like source of nourishment that was required for my child in the way that it was before um, so I think that's a piece of it too, of like, it's not just the messages that we're being told about our bodies in the postpartum period, but it's also mm -hmm. this like disembodiment that can happen because your body is not your own. And you have had this loss of bodily autonomy. Um, so I think that can really like contribute to this whole tornado that can happen for people where they they do end up engaging in disorder eating behaviors whether they mean to or not i mean sometimes it's just like there's all these additional barriers to interoception right like with intuitive yeah. eating we talk about interoception and um there's a lot of barriers to that when you're sleep deprived when you have um this new life change and stressor of having a kid and needing to care for them um, especially if it's like the first time that you've like had, you know, a baby. And so you're, you know, adjusting to parenthood in general, um, on top yeah. of caring for this human. So I think the bodily autonomy piece is a big contributing factor to this too. Yeah. There's so many layers that can affect our, our body image postpartum. Um, yeah. body image in general, but postpartum, we've just got all these extra layers added on that maybe aren't usually there for us in, in other periods of our life. Mm -hmm. Knowing the, that all these layers will kind of be added on and, and the risk that we are at navigating a, a new body in our world, are there any steps that we can take maybe during pregnancy, maybe during the pregnancy journey or beforehand to help prepare ourselves for navigating the postpartum body image? period and mm. our relationship with food afterwards as well. Yeah, it's really hard because there is a lot of different things that you can try to prepare for, you know, before it happens. Um, but I think for a lot of people, there's this big anticipation like of the birth right? So I think it's really hard for people to really conceptualize something like, oh, how am I going to cope with this after? Or, um, you know, how am I going to adjust? Or how, you know, what will my relationship to my body look like? Because you're just so consumed with, um, oh my goodness, like what's labor and delivery going to be like? And what's it going to be like when I get to meet my child? Um, but I do think one thing that 
people can do that could be helpful is just trying as much as you can to normalize diverse bodies in general Mm -hmm. Uh, but on top of that and specifically to normalize diverse postpartum bodies Um, and you do have to get creative with it sometimes of just like exposing yourself and becoming desensitized just to to images and to stories and to people uh, that have diverse postpartum bodies you know where you're seeing all kinds of different um, representations of what that can look like like representation is really important and so like the podcast that you're listening to you know the hosts what do they look like uh, the tv shows that you're watching the movies the literature that you're reading you know your your social media feed like the, these things are all really important because um the representation for postpartum bodies is really really lacking um And I think like if you do start doing that work ahead of time and hopefully like continue that into postpartum period and beyond, I do think it will help because you do over time begin to see it as more and more normal. Um, Like I know for me, there, there was one like influencer in particular that I followed um, before I gave birth and it really meant a lot to me that she was just showing her postpartum body and all of its stretch marks and loose skin and, you know, having, having like, uh, that excess fat, like in the abdomen and Mm -hmm. her not really adjusting, like, you know, what she was wearing and, and just showing it, like, just showing like, yeah, like, this is what my body looks like while still being, while still like, you know, talking about her own past struggles with body image and with disordered eating. But I think for her, it seems like it's important for me to show like what my body looks like and to be like, this is normal. And like, you don't have to try and quote unquote bounce back. And she's, she's like, that's not something I'm going to do. Cause for me, I know that means like an eating disorder and I don't think that's going to serve me. So that was, that was really helpful for me personally, because I knew what some of those bodies looked like. And like I said, we don't really know unless we like seek it out unless we try to find it because you're not going to just find it like by accident you're not (laughs) I think it helped too that like you know I have uh I have you know family members that had given birth and you know maybe sometimes you might um you know you're more likely to see like the body of like a close family member than maybe just like people out in the world or whatever because there's like a closer relationship there but I think that's a really big thing that people can do is just normalizing and diversifying your feed so that those bodies become the new normal and you you are helping to create like a new dominant story or a new dominant discourse like at least for you and the way that you view the world yeah and what we see as is normal is just what we're surrounded by the most or the messages that we hear and receive the most and um, act on ourselves the most. The images that we kind of see of all these idolized bodies, whether it's regular like bodies yeah. that haven't been through pregnancy or postpartum bodies, we often just see this idolized like one type of body and we have a culture of hiding a body that doesn't fit the ideal so because of that we don't really see the full spectrum but when we do like find this more diversity then our normal really changes the the thought Mm -hmm. pathways in our brain can really shift from this is what my body should look like to like hey there's a whole variety of what's normal and whatever my body looks like is actually normal it's fine yeah and and that's why I say like the the first step really is just diverse bodies in general, yeah. like racialized bodies, disabled bodies, like bodies that look different than you, whatever that looks like for you. Right. So, so even if, if you, if you do have a body that isn't represented, you know, as much as others of like intentionally seeking that out and finding bodies that look like yours and finding more importantly, lots of bodies that look 
very different from yours in all kinds of different ways. Yeah, I love that. And for maybe listeners who might be currently navigating postpartum and struggling with a stressful relationship with food or poor body image themselves at the moment, what are some ways that we can maybe improve our body image or our relationship with food at that point? Yeah, I mean, I think um, if you have the resources to do so, you know, to connect with supports, because you don't have to go through this alone. And it is, it can be an isolating experience, just being a parent in general, um, or being like a birthing parent. Um, So whether it's a therapist, a dietitian, or a support group, if you have access to those resources to use them, Um, and as far as like the intuitive eating principles, I think there's a few that are really relevant, but remembering that like the first principle is number one for a reason, rejecting the diet mentality. And so this does go back again to like consuming content that is in alignment with that supporting content that, um, you know, that you're listening to fat activists and that you're, Um, listening to stories of people with diverse bodies, that whole spectrum of diverse bodies, and like revisiting if you haven't in a while, um, you know, things that are in alignment of critiquing diet culture, things that are anti-diet and, you know, health at every size, um, and reminding yourself of, you know, the research of uh, weight loss studies and and dieting studies um in that they don't work and just reminding yourself of those hard facts that's something I do sometimes of like okay I gotta remind myself of like the success rate and like even if I were you know to do all this it's not gonna work um so that rejecting the dieting mentality I think is is really the biggest piece um and especially you know as far as honoring your hunger I mean, that principle is even more important for that postpartum period, because I mean, you have just gone, if you're a birthing person, you have just gone through a major medical event um, and your body has to recover. Whether you birthed uh, vaginally or by C-section, like you have to recover. Like that is major you know, if you have a C-section, that is major surgery, major, major surgery, abdominal surgery. So like you have to recover, you're probably sleep deprived, you're coming off of maybe some pretty intense medications and hormones are all over the place. And you're also having to like, make sure this human survives and it's like, okay. And um, nourishment and uh, like energy is even more important. Um And on top of that, like I said, if you're breastfeeding or chest feeding, you need energy uh, via food for milk production. Um, So it's even more important that, you know, that your hunger is honored um, during that like really critical, I think, early postpartum time, especially uh, just because it's such a vulnerable time for birthing people. <clears throat> yeah. When we think about all the barriers as well that we might experience to honoring our hunger. So not just from body image or from uh, wanting to, to go back to dieting, but just from maybe it's having food available for ourselves because we're so tired yeah. and we can't get to the shops or it's, we're so consumed with caring for someone else that we can yeah. maybe forget to care for ourselves as well. Or that's, that's put second as well oh yeah you don't have time to like cook anything like for weeks um and that's just like you know that's just with one kid so I you know there were there were things ahead of time that I did to try and like cope with that like I did have I asked people to like I was happy to accept food from people and I was at a place where you know that was something that I was comfortable with um And I'm so grateful that I like, I didn't have to cook for weeks, basically. And, you know, that was a resource that I had access to, but I, I didn't know what time of day it was. I didn't know 
what day I didn't know what way was up, what way was down. So then on top of that, you're asking people to like remember to eat and then all of like the practical uh, tasks involved in eating and food mm -hmm. preparation. Uh, yeah, there's lots of barriers there that have nothing to do with diet culture. Um, so yeah, like mm -hmm. I, my partner had to remind me to eat. I had to have things that were like really accessible to eat and be like, okay, liquid nutrition is like, what is going to work for right now for this moment? And, mm -hmm. um, yes, yeah, so there's a lot of barriers there for people, um, to be able to honor your hunger. Um, so I guess now that I think about it, that could maybe probably be another thing that could be helpful to prepare for, like before you have a baby, um, so that you've kind of taken that, uh, like task of executive functioning off of your, you know, off of your responsibility. Yeah. Um, so that you so that yeah you food becomes more accessible or eating is more accessible to you during a time that is like really really wild definitely yeah that's <clears throat> a great tip for preparing and it's also navigating feeding ourselves in that period can be really tied back to uh, rejecting the diet mentality as well which isn't just rejecting like um, the idea yeah. of actual dieting or restricting food it's also rejecting yeah. um, ideal, that there's an ideal body, like that doesn't exist, but also an ideal way of eating. We get all these messages about healthy food and unhealthy food and good food and bad food. That's not a mm -hmm. thing. There's no such thing. And the way yeah. the food that's going to be best for our body is dependent on so many things. And one of them is accessibility and just what we're able yes. to navigate, like having access Absolutely. to and physically eating or have time for eating. So having whatever food is most accessible at the moment is the healthiest option. Yeah. Yeah. Because you, there can be, you know, really dramatic appetite changes. Yeah. Um, when I was breastfeeding, I have never been so hungry in my life than when I was uh, just starting out breastfeeding. Um, but it's yeah. still very hard to eat because you're like, really, am I hungry mm -hmm. again? Like, how is that possible? Yeah. But like, yeah, and this is when, this is when like rejecting the diet mentality is useful when you, you remind yourself, okay, I just had major surgery. I haven't, you know, been sleeping. This is, you know, this is what's going on for me. Yes, you're still hungry. Of course, you're still hungry. It makes sense that you're hungry. You deserve yeah. to feed yourself. You need this. Your body really yeah. needs this from you. Uh, and reminding yourself of that. Yeah, you have permission to be hungry and to honor that hunger as well. Yeah. Yeah, I was basically just hungry all of the time for like months. And that's very normal. I think that's normal yeah. for a lot of people. I've heard similar things from, from others as well. Yeah. This has been so helpful, Raquel. It's been such a nice conversation and I'm sure there's a lot that listeners will have got out of this as well. Um, if listeners want to, to find you and learn more, where can they, they go to find you? Yeah, it's been such a pleasure talking to you. I, I really enjoy talking about this whole kind of area and how it intersects with disordered eating and body image. So um, thank you so much for having me. It was, it was really nice to be able to talk about it. Um, if anyone happens to be in Canada, it, specifically uh, if you're in Ontario or Nova Scotia or New Brunswick, those are the provinces um, that I practice in virtually. Um, you can find me um, online through my website. I have a virtual practice called Birch Stand Mental Health Services, like birches and birch tree. Um, so my website is birchstand.ca. You can find me on Instagram at Birch Stand Mental Health. Um, if you have any questions or you want to connect, you can send me an email, which is my first name, Raquel, R-A-Q-U-E-L, at birchstand.ca. Um, and I also want to mention, too, uh, maybe this is something, I don't know if you link in descriptions normally. Yeah, yeah, um, I will. I'll link it all. But I, I did write a blog post last year for uh, Netic, 
which is the National Eating Disorder Information Center um, uh, for Canada. It's Canada-based. Um, and I wrote a blog post on navigating postpartum body image. So there's a lot more kind of like specific tips of like what people can do to kind of navigate during that time. Um, and I'm, I'm also going to be uh, facilitating a free support group um, for people living in Ontario um, this fall. Uh, who are looking for eating disorder support, who also happen to be pregnant. So I'm going to be facilitating that support group um, from October to December. And depending on when this comes out, um, if that time has passed uh, for people or by the time you're listening to this, um, we'll be running the group again in the new year. So if you happen to be in Ontario and that sounds like you and you're looking for um, free support group, um, then yeah, that might be the thing for you. Oh, that sounds so lovely. And we'll definitely link to all of that in the show notes as well. Great. It's been really nice. Thanks so much. It's been so lovely to share this episode with you today. I would love for you to visit today's guest with the links they shared and for more support and information, including articles, free resources, online courses, and individualized support, you can visit my home on the internet at foodlifefreedom.com. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a rating and review on the podcast platform you use. And feel free to use the three dot symbol to share with anyone who may find this episode helpful. If you have a question or topic you would love to have covered on the podcast, I would love to hear from you.